You can improve color contrast within a true color image by reassigning color within the image to get that contrast while minimally altering the color of the image. And you aren't limited by palette choices. In other words, you're not limited to SHO, HSO, HOO, or even the RGB color palettes in doing so. And this allows you tremendous freedom to find the color that's going to relate the information in the best way possible. It also allows you to portray the information within the image clearly, whether or not you're using a monochrome camera and shooting an LRGB or RGB or a one-shot color camera. It's possible that this technique could also be applied to narrowband information in some circumstances. However, since I live under dark skies and I usually shoot an LRGB, I haven't been able to test whether that's so. But this LRGB image that you're seeing right here is the product of such a method, which I'm calling at this time high frequency color contrast. My goal in using this technique is to maintain as much color fidelity as possible while relating the information within the image. But if a person wanted to apply false color techniques, they could get awfully creative. All right, let's take a look and see how it's done. And don't fret, it's remarkably simple if you're even moderately familiar with layer-based photo editing. The effect of this technique could be done in a very pronounced way, but I think it's best when it's done very subtly. Used just to enhance the fine details color contrast to help the detailed information stand out in images like this, where there is a predominance of one or two colors or shades. And if you're curious and don't recognize this region of sky, this is a high focal length portrayal of the region just outside the cave structure of Lima Bravo November LBN 529, otherwise known as the Cave Nebula. I've been shooting this for the past three nights, though this is only the last two nights worth of integration. I've yet to process the most recent integration. Here's the image before the high frequency color contrast technique. Pay a special attention to the small patch of ionized nebulosity to the upper right. The detail in the reflection nebulae, center left. The structure detail throughout the dark dust cloud that predominates three quarters of the image from the upper left down to the lower right. And the detail in the hydrogen and sulfur ionized region down on the lower right. Well, heck, I guess you might as well just pay attention to the detail throughout the entire image because the change is subtle, but significant. Now, here's the information after the high frequency color contrast technique has been applied. Watch again, this time I'll transition between the two versions much more quickly. Here's the information before the application of the high frequency color contrast technique. And here's the image after the application of the high frequency color contrast technique. It's subtle, but I find often the best edits are very subtle. I really feel that good astrophotography is made with a minimalistic approach, putting together many slight improvements as opposed to aiming for one massive improvement. Probably the only massive improvement I think that we should see in astrophotography is the original stretching of the histogram. In short, what I've done is taken the information from the Green Master, separated it into its high and low frequency components, discarded the low frequency component, and then assigned a color, in this case sulfur yellow, to the high frequency component. This will blend the Green Master's delicate high frequency information into the image gently by adding just enough high frequency color contrast information to add detail where it's needed within the image, at least at this step of integration. All right, let's walk through how to do that. It's quite straightforward. I'm now in Affinity Photo 2, where I've nearly completed developing the information. But you can clearly see that the contrast is soft. Details are there, but they do not stand out well. And much of this has to do with the relatively soft color between the main areas of interest within this image. So I want to enhance the color contrast in a way that's going to stay fairly close to the true color. I have to deviate from it a little bit because I have to create contrast, but I want to deviate as little as possible. To create this deviation, I'm going to work on the channel that moderates the predominant colors of most DSOs. That's the green channel. Most DSOs are predominated by red and blue, usually red, but sometimes blue, and often a mix of the two. The green channel between is what relates detail. So I'm going to pop over to PixInsight and select the Green Master and clone it by just dragging its icon a little over. 
and then drop in the icon and PixInsight will automatically create a clone of the original image. And this is an unprocessed master. So I'm going to run the Blur Exterminator on it to sharpen it. Because I use an SCT and star shapes can occasionally be problematic in SCT. So my SCT seems to have really good optics and that's not really an issue, but I like to be cautious. So I first run the Blur Exterminator in the correct mode, which is specifically for correcting star shapes. And then I run it in the default mode, which deconvolves the stars and sharpens up everything within the image using non-additive AI. And once the Blur Exterminator has done its thing, then I'm going to run the Star Exterminator and get rid of those stars. We don't need them for what we're going to do here. And I'm running the Star Exterminator on its highest level of AI and also the large overlap, which, I don't know, it might add 30 seconds to a minute to the procedure, but you get better results. Um, I look at astrophotography like making wines, and I've been making wine, as I've mentioned in other videos, since I was a little kid. I grew up in a French family. It was part of what we did. And... You take your time and it's often a year from start to finish. Well, happily astrophotography doesn't take a year to go from start to finish, but the way I look at it is it's done when it's done. I'll give each step as long as it takes to get the best outcome. Okay, Star Exterminator has finished its job. The stars have been removed from the image and now I need to perform a histogram stretch. I'm going to deviate from my usual evolved histogram method that I've covered in other videos here and make a tighter histogram with a higher black point and a higher peak. This will provide a brighter and higher contrast histogram. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to emphasize specifically the high frequency information within the image, because we're going to rip this image in half later on. And it's just that high frequency, high contrast detail that we're going to keep from it. It's not hard, hang on. Having found the histogram stretch that I'm looking for, I'm going to apply the histogram to the image. It's a far brighter, more contrasty histogram than I would ever go for, but that's perfectly okay because that background brightness, which has resulted from overstretching the histogram, is a low frequency component that's going to be removed later on. And now that the histogram has been stretched, it's time to apply the noise exterminator. And I know some of you are going to point out, you're not using the latest version of noise exterminator. I'm a bit, how do I put it? I'm a bit wary of applying updates. I don't update my software every time the latest doodad pops out because honestly so much of it is pointless bells and whistles but more to the point when I get my software doing what I want it to do I don't see a need to change it I'm not just going to change it because it's the latest thing and everybody's doing that and the noise exterminator where it was before the previous update as far as I was concerned was ideal it does exactly the job I'm looking for you know the little saying if it ain't broke don't fix it well, I'm applying that here. So noise has been removed from the green master and now I'm saving it as a 16-bit lossless TIFF. And once it's saved, we're going to open it up again in Affinity Photo because we need layer-based photo editing capabilities for the next step. Now we're back in Affinity Photo and I'm going to drag in the new developed green master. Now I'm going to open the shapes tool down on the lower left toolbar. It's been preset for a square shape. Then I'm going to click and drag a square over the image. And then I'm going to select a color for that square. And I'm going to designate the square to be around sulfur yellow. I'm using the color box up on the top right of Affinity Photo to choose my color. I can graphically click anywhere on the visible spectrum to pick any specific color, or click and drag on that spectrum to look through a range of colors. Or I can use the RGB bars just above the image of the visible spectrum to pick a color even more precisely either by clicking and dragging on the bars or by specifying a precise numeric value for the color. Then I'm going to assign this color to the green master by using one of the darkened composite modes. There is no fixed particular mode that is best. I'll use one of the darkened composite modes because they'll darken the low frequency information while brightening the high frequency information. And among the various darkened composite modes, I'll use whichever composite mode happens to emphasize this image's high frequency contrast the best. And in this case, this looks to be the color burn composite mode. So I'll click on the color burn composite mode and the yellow color will be composited onto the green master below. By the way, I'm sure you've noticed the green master was shot in monochrome. If you shot it with an OSC and it's green, just desaturate the master before this step. Now I'll select the color layer and the high frequency layer, then right click on one of the layers and select the merge selected option. This will composite the color layer and the high frequency layer into a new layer with all the combined information. And this is necessary for the next step. Now I'm going to go up top and select the filters drop down menu and there I'll select the frequency separation tool. 
I'll drag the frequency separation slider bar to 100 pixels or all the way to the right and activate the tool. This will entirely separate the now yellow green master into its high and low frequency components. Low frequency is where light and shadow is and where most of the color is, and the high frequency contains the fine detail information. For our purposes, we don't need the low frequency information, so I'm just going to delete that layer. Now, we don't want this information to affect the stars, there's something else entirely, so we're going to drag the high frequency layer below the star layer. But because working layers can become very complicated and we need to know what layer does what, I'm going to designate this layer with a name. In this case, a simple descriptive, G assigned to yellow HF for high frequency. Now, let's go ahead and drag our new green to yellow high frequency layer below the star layer. The next thing to do is select the best composite mode to add the high frequency information to the image below. There is no ideal composite mode. Affinity Photo offers almost 40 composite modes and because every image has different characteristics, one should look through the various composite modes and find which one adds the information in the most pleasing and useful way that meets your goals. My goal is to create a little color contrast around the fine detail information to help it stand out in areas of monotonous color, which is that red zone down in the lower right third and the primarily dark, dusty regions throughout the upper two thirds of the left side of the image. I've also added a mask to the high frequency layer because there are going to be certain places in the image I don't want this to affect, but we'll come back to the mask. In Affinity Photo 2, it's very easy to select which composite mode that you want. Unlike some other popular astrophotography developing software, you don't have to process an image to see what your outcomes are and then go back. You can see the effects of every edit on the image live as you work. I'll just open the composite mode drop down menu and go through the various composite modes till I find the one that I want. But due to over a decade of experience with Affinity Photo, I know that this is either going to be linear lights, which offers high, sharp, high frequency contrast, or the soft light composite mode, which is similar, but has softer high frequency contrast. Since the high frequency fine detail in the green master was so subtle, I'll opt for the linear light composite mode here due to its high contrast with fine high frequency detail. The yellow color has a way of blending into the image very naturally especially in the red regions where it becomes a faint gold that nicely outlines a lot of the fine detail. But adding in additional high frequency information, even very subtle information like what was in the green master, can have strong effects on very bright areas and might over brighten the brightest stars. For example, that bright star surrounded by a yellowish haze on the lower right side of the image. Adding in the new high frequency layer has over brightened it and that's why I dropped in the mask I'm going to erase out the effects of the high frequency information from that star. And this will reduce the star size and brightness and that yellow cast somewhat. I'll select the paintbrush and the color black and paint on the mask to remove the high frequency information from that star. Manual mask removal of high frequency information is very easy to accomplish. Such information just affects fine detail. So manually masking it out will not show up looking artificial within the image. The purpose behind this technique is to add color contrast to an image to emphasize fine detail. But unlike using false color palettes to do this, which can be heavy handed, restricting color change to the high frequency information merely lightly outlines fine detail with color contrast. And that leaves the overall color of the image untouched. So the large low frequency patches of color located all through the image from the blues of the reflection nebula to the reds of the emission nebula are not transformed while their structures show up more clearly. Let's take a moment to compare and contrast. Here's before the high frequency information, and here's after. Before, after. The difference, as you can see, is very subtle, just a very slight enhancement of the fine detail information. But that's exactly what we want. I don't want to transform the color or make any major changes to the natural image. I just want to enhance the color contrast to help that fine detail information in the soft contrast image stand out. You may also have noticed that along the right edge, adding the additional high frequency information creates undesirable pale artifacts along the edge. It's pretty common where adding high frequency information creates artifacts along edges of images. It is, however, easily remedied. I'll just click on that mask layer that I've applied to the image. It's a white mask, so it lets everything through, and I'll select the black color which will block information in the mask. And then I'll click on the paintbrush and paint black on the mask around the edges of the image to remove the effects of the additional high frequency layer from the edges, which will remove that artifact. I'm not even going to show it. It's a pretty boring standard part of the procedure. 
Now I have a few other developing steps to do that are beyond the scope of this video. They don't have to do with the addition of high frequency color contrast information. And they yield a final image that looks like this. And the following night was another clear, black, moonless night. Meteorology had suggested I anticipate heavy cloud cover for about two-thirds of the night, but there turned out to be only slight cloud cover for a couple hours. So I imaged through the entire night. If I'd known it was going to be a long night, I would have added a little bit more RGB information, but I thought I was only going to get two or three hours of information, so I just shot on the luminance channel, and I ended up with six beautiful hours of luminance information made with superb guiding. As we've talked about in previous videos, luminance information provides three times the information of separate R, G, and B filters, and many, many times more information than narrowband filters, simply because it captures all the information within the visible spectrum at the same time. So it's just much more effective and efficient at information gathering. This added a lot of fine detail and luminosity information to the image, though it did not transform the color at all. So, when the additional luminance information was stacked and added to the image, it yielded a final output of the chemically complex region above the cave nebula LBN529 that looked like this. With so much additional luminance information, both the high frequency and the light and shadow or low frequency needs of the image were complete. And so after three nights of shooting, I'll call this imaging project complete. Nonetheless, the addition of the high frequency information remains an important part of developing out the detail within this image. To illustrate, here's an example of the image without the additional high frequency information. And here's the image with the additional high frequency information. Without and with. I did do one thing different. All that additional luminosity information increased the high frequency information in the dark areas. So the yellow high frequency information from the Green Master was adversely affecting those darker areas, especially in the reflection and ionization regions in the lower left and center right of the image. So I removed the sulfur yellow color cast from the high frequency information in the lower two thirds of the image that covered the darker multicolored areas and that restored those regions to a more natural color while still enhancing the detail of those areas. The yellow cast was left in the upper left of the image because it fits in well with the general red profile of that image and nicely outlines the high frequency detail information there. This high frequency color contrast technique can be used with information shot in LRGB, RGB, and one-shot color cameras. I don't see any reason it could not also be used with narrowband information just since I rarely ever shoot nowhere bands, since I live at a dark sky site, I'm not entirely sure if it would be beneficial. Or maybe I should say, I don't know if you'd really need it, because since narrow band imaging only captures narrow bands of the visible spectrum, well, it has that tremendous disadvantage that it is far less effective at capturing information. It just needs a lot more time to capture information. It has the tremendous advantage that because it's capturing very specific information, that information has we'll call it an innate appearance of sharpness. So you may not find this technique all that useful for narrowband imaging. I also question whether or not it'd be useful with narrowband shooting, because narrowband shooting isn't through RGB or color shooting, and you don't quite have the range of color shading. So applying a technique like this to narrowband images might create color contrast that's a bit too sharp to really fit into an image naturally. If you experiment with this method with some narrowband information, please let me know what the outcomes are. Thank you for watching. Let me know if you have any questions, thoughts, or comments. And above all else, enjoy and learn from the beauty and wonder of the cosmos while you get out there and shoot the sky.